Welcome to the 2021 Spring Meetings Governor Talk Series. I am Alejandro Werner, Director of the Western Hemisphere Department at the IMF. I want to thank Governor Campos Neto for joining me today. Roberto Campos has been the Governor of the Central Bank of Brazil since February 2019. A UCLA-trained economist, Roberto has extensive experience in the financial sector. He has held various leadership roles over 20 years at Santander Bank. I would like to congratulate Roberto on being named Central Banker of the Year in 2021 by the banker in recognition of the Brazilian Central Bank's effective response to the pandemic and also on the recent legislative passage of the Central Bank Autonomy Bill. Roberto and many of his predecessors have worked very hard to achieve this landmark ruling. Again, thanks, Roberto, for uh, joining us in these talks. I mean, before we move to Brazil, let's talk about the challenges facing emerging markets more than one year into the pandemic. Specifically, what do you see as the key policy priorities for emerging markets in the next 12 months? To what extent will the vaccine rollout affect the pace of recovery? And how will the latest round of advanced economies policy responses, in specifically, the large fiscal package that was recently uh, approved by the U.S. impact emerging markets. Well, thank you, Alejandro. Uh, thank, thanks for the invitation. It's, it's a pleasure for me. Um, I think all the questions, all the, the points that you've mentioned are actually uh, very uh, well connected. Um, if you go back to uh, probably November of, uh, of last year, um, I, I think we, we at the central bank in Brazil started to uh, realize that we had the, the ingredients for what I called at the time uh, the beginning uh, uh, of what uh, would be a reflation trade. Why? And I remember actually I, I mentioned um, that um, this was probably our scenario in some of the international meetings that are participated. But why? Well, we were seeing basically that um, there is this uh, feeling of low uh, for long, low inflation, uh, low rates for long. Um, inflation was, you know, I, I like this expression uh, a bit uh, comfortably numb because everybody thought uh, we are not going to see inflation for a while. The market was prepared for that. And then this starts to, um, to change. Um, we started to see that in November and December. I think people didn't pay much, much attention to that. But eventually, I think that that issue of, of the reflation trade starts, started to kick in. Why? Well, because we were seeing uh, that uh, we had huge coordination in fiscal and monetary policy. So we had huge packages uh, in most of the countries. And at the same time, we were starting to see the end, uh, the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of the, the vaccination. So we, we were seeing that basically you, at, at some point in time, you're going to have the two things going together. Um, the stimulus are still uh, big, the packages are still uh, being, uh, being applied. And at the same time, people started to see uh, a better environment in terms of opening the economies. And, and that would give rise, uh, in our opinion at that time, uh, to, what, uh, to what, what we call the beginning of the reflation trade. And I think that's what's happening now. What we see basically now, and I think we are beginning to advance into that, is uh, you see commodities rising, and you have uh, many issues related to that. You have issues related to Asia. You have the infrastructure uh, package that was announced in the U.S. that affect, is affecting metals. But you started to see commod commodities rising. But uh, contrary to what you saw in the past, you didn't see uh, uh, you, you didn't see the commodities of of, uh, uh, of these countries, of emerging market countries that are producing commodities. You didn't see the currency. Sorry, you didn't see the currency of these countries that are producing commodities performing well. So if commodities are going higher and the currencies are not performing well, it means that the pr local price uh, of commodities is going even higher. In the case of Brazil, this was uh, more exacerbated because actually the currency depreciated in the meantime. So if, if commodities are going higher, your currency is not doing well. Uh, basically, when you look at, especially at the soft commodity, it means that food inflation is going higher. And when you look at food inflation in in, in the world, it was it was going higher. Uh, this year kept uh, going higher. We actually had an acceleration the last two months, <clears throat> and then you start to see a differentiation. Why? Because you know 
a lot of emerging market countries, the, the, the weight of the food in the inflation index is much higher than a developed economy. So we were going into this uh, stage in which we're seeing food prices going higher. Uh, we're seeing commodity prices going higher. In our opinion, some of these commodity changes were more structural than people thought. Um, and at the same time, we need to remember that most of these emerging market countries, if, to face the pandemic, they had to do also <clears throat> big fiscal packages, which means that they are coming out of this with a much higher debt. So we are going into this, uh, uh, finally, in this environment in which all of a sudden the market starts to price that you're going to have to hike rates, but you have a much higher debt. So you have this, uh, uh, this differentiation going on. You can see that the countries that have more or have higher debt uh, have had more devaluation of the currencies, have had more risk premiums at the end of the curve. And you started to see that as you price more and more these interest rate hikes, the differentiation goes uh, even uh, wider. And obviously, it's not the case of some developed countries because you know people look at the end and still see that you know if you're able to grow uh, more uh, than what you pay in interest rates. In other words, if if uh, if uh, G is, is bigger than R, then you know you're fine, and this all, and, and this I think creates even a further differentiation uh, when when we see. When you look at that in emerging market countries, basically what you see is that uh, we go from, uh, if you compare to 2007, for example, we go from a period in which it was around 40% of GDP uh, to the the pandemic level, which is around 74, 75% of GDP, but. Uh, there are two things that are different. The duration is now twice as long, and the rates in which this debt was contracted is almost half. So the convexity effect of this debt, so the VAR that, that, that is out there in the market is much, much higher. Um, on the top of that, when you see the flows, uh, where the flows are going, you have a, a phenomenon that you didn't have before, which is China is absorbing a lot of the, the flows that used to go to a lot of these other emerging market countries. Uh, on the top of that, I think you have this questioning of this global value chain, how this is going to be in the future. And this is also affecting the way people look at emerging market countries, and it's also helping uh, the differentiation. So I think at the end, the conclusion is I think everything that you mentioned is tied together. Um, what I, I've been saying is that the normalization process in some of the advanced economies will cost uh, emerging market countries to go into some level uh, uh, um, of the stress at some point in time. Um, and we are seeing a big differentiation now, and the differentiation, I think, reflects that. So I think that's uh, uh, how I would answer this question. Thanks, Roberto, and, and very interesting. And just for, for our international audience, I mean, who would have thought that interest rates would be so low in Brazil, even after uh, your hike of the other day? I mean, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I mean, it was always the case that we used to say that it was a puzzle of why interest rates were so high in Brazil. It was a structural issue that you guys have been able to, to break, and I didn't say, say it in my introduction, but basically also congratulations to you and your predecessors, because now Brazil has been able to, to fix all those structural issues so that interest rates in Brazil can really, uh, uh, really came down significantly from a structural point of view. And now, I mean, I, I, I mean the, the transmission of your monetary policy, it's much more powerful because of this. So, so now that we turn to Brazil, we see that inflation and short-term inflation expectations have risen above target in recent months, and international bond yields are rising. On the other hand, the Brazilian economy, and especially the labor market, remain weak, and longer-dated survey expectations remain well anchored. In this context, and in view of the high degree of economic uncertainty, what is the biggest challenges for monetary policy in your country today? Well, I, I think that the biggest challenges uh, that Brazil has are all linked to the fiscal. Um, I've, I've, I've been saying that uh, um, it's, it's been all about fiscal. I think you mentioned the way we were able to break into the dynamic of high interest rates. And I think the way we were, were able to break into that was to um, to give uh, credibility to the market in terms of being uh, on a way to fiscal conversion. So I think it's a lot about fiscal. When you look at inflation recently in Brazil, what you see basically is that, uh, and I mentioned that in the first, uh, in the answer to the first question, was that you had these two things uh, going on. You had at the same time commodities going higher and higher 
And in the case of Brazil, the currency devaluating, uh, and in some cases evaluating uh, much more than its peers. So uh, the reality is that the price of commodities locally uh, was rising a lot. When we look at commodities, you can uh, basically separate between soft and, and the hard. So uh, when you look at uh, the food items uh, and you look at soy and corn and you see what's happening, a lot of it is a structural. You're seeing a higher demand for soy um, in the rebuilding of, of the protein chain in China, more and more buying from Asian countries like India and other countries. Uh, you saw uh, that is also contaminating corn. You, see, you saw what happened to corn prices yesterday with the news coming out of the U.S. So um, you have these uh, issues uh, related to um, the, the, the change in, in, in more food, eating more food at home, but also some structural issues relating to how you, uh, you build your, your protein chain. Uh, on the top of that, you have the, the metals also going higher, and that has to do with an anticipation um, that the, the, the global recession wasn't uh, going to be so uh, intense, and, and that, I think, has been affecting price. On the top of that, you have the U.S. with a large infrastructure program, China also doing investment in infrastructure. And I think when you look at oil, it's basically uh, uh, an element of expectations that you know, the, 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 the world is going to go back into growth. You're seeing uh, revisions in growth uh, higher and higher. So a lot of it is commodities. Uh, you have the effects depreciation uh, phenomenon that I mentioned. Uh, in the case of Brazil, you had a large transfer program. So you had a transfer program that basically we've never done before. Uh, we transferred a large amount of money uh, to a lot of people, uh, and that turned into consumption. So you see that the items that are more linked uh, to uh, the consumption basket of the people who are benefited by the transfers uh, went higher in price uh, faster. Uh, you also had a small disruption in supply from the social distance. I think every country saw that. I don't think that plays a major part, but I think it's part of the story. Uh, and in the case of Brazil, you also, uh, in the year of 2020, had some climate uh, issues that affected the harvest. So when you look at inflation, it's basically uh, when you look from, from, from the view of central banker, you would probably say most of these things are temporary shocks. Um, when you look from uh, one uh, policy uh, meeting to the other policy meeting, the inflation for 2020 basically jumped from 3.4 to 5. <clears throat> this difference, 1.6, was basically all attributed to the factors that I mentioned, but, but more so to commodities and the effects appreciation. So uh, uh, we look at that, but we started to see some uh, contamination into the core numbers because of, of the persistence of the devaluation, because of the persistence of the commodities at a higher price. So we started to see uh, some uh, contamination. So we initiated uh, what we call a, a partial uh, normalization process. And uh, it, it's always very difficult to explain when you are initiating a process like that in, in a stage in which the country is still facing a lot of problems uh, with the pandemic. Uh, but we saw that the contamination was increasing. Uh, as you mentioned, when we lower interest rates to 2%, uh, the scenario that was, in our mind, never realized. Uh, when we set the interest rate at 2%, we were talking about a growth that some people thought was going to be min minus 8, minus 9. And the inflation expectation was below 2%. And some people actually were, uh, were having numbers uh, lower than 1.5%. And that never realized. The, the third thing is uh, we still think that we need stimulative conditions. And that's why we are mentioning partial normalization in the process. Uh, we think that uh, doing a front-loaded movement, um, you're probably going to gain efficiency from that once you saw that your rate is not what it should be, and it was set for a scenario that didn't happen. So we thought that uh, doing front-loaded will increase efficiency, which means that you need to raise less rates at the end. Um, uh, and, and we still think that a lot of these factors are temporary. We're watching the way... Uh, this is uh, disseminating into the economy. Uh, and going also to the to the labor market part, uh, uh, we see that the, the formal labor for and there is a lot of um, there's a lot of debate on whether we me we're measuring this right or not. There are two ways, there are two main indexes and are not connected. They are saying different things, but uh, we and we we uh, we elaborate on that on our inflation report uh, that came out uh, <clears throat> this month. 
But basically, what we're seeing is what we're seeing is that the, the formal uh, employment is recovering very fast. We actually created jobs in the year of 2020, uh, contrary to our expectations. So the formal labor force is doing well. Uh, we just had a number this week that was twice as high as people expected. But the informal labor force is where the problem is. Um, it's very difficult to pinpoint now how this. Uh, this uh, this process is going to take place. Some people say, you know, as the economy opens, the informal labor force is going to uh, uh, the informal labor force is going to get jobs very fast. Some other people say, no, there are some uh, changes in the economy that will uh, make this process uh, much more slower. But I think on the labor force, we can say that the formal labor force is doing uh, the recovery was much faster than we were expected, and we still have an unknown in terms of the informal labor force. Thank you. Thanks, Roberto, and, and thanks for reminding us uh, by such a large margin that we missed on our growth forecast last year. We were one of the analysts that I was actually uh, looking towards a very large recession in Brazil. And at the end, I mean, uh, the contraction of GDP in Brazil was uh, significantly smaller than what uh, a lot of people thought, and I think it was one of the smallest uh, of the big economies in, in, in Latin America. In, in big reason, thanks to, to, to the very uh, fast and large uh, policy response. And I, I will highlight also that when you look at in private investment and investment in Brazil, uh, uh, I think it was, again, one of the countries in which investment suffered the least throughout the pandemic, uh, also helping uh, to sustain economic activity during the, uh, the pandemic. Let's turn uh, to the support that you gave uh, uh, to the productive sector, to firms uh, through a uh, liquidity measure. That was another historic uh, part of your policy response as the BCB implemented extensive liquidity and capital relief measures, lower reserve requirements, temporary relief for increasing provisions on renegotiated loans, lower capital requirements for credit to SMEs, among other measures. What lessons do you draw from the 2020 crisis in terms of the effectiveness of these measures? Uh, are there any lessons uh, that, that would make you think that uh, 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 if you have to do them again, you would make some changes uh, to the package of support to the productive sector? That's a very good question. Um, I think when we, when we enter into the uh, pandemic, the first thing is that uh, the earlier you recognize that you're going to have a problem, the better. Um, and then you have more time to think about the measures that you need to design. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the central bank in Brazil, I think uh, we were seeing what was happening at the time in China and then it started in Italy. And, uh, you know, I started to, we started to realize that at some point in time, we will have some kind of social distance one way or the other. We, we never expected the impact that we had, but, you know, we thought, you know, it's better to do uh, sooner than, than, than doing later. Uh, when you look at all the measures that countries adopted in, in terms of uh, facing the pandemic, you can basically divide in five parts. Um, you have the liquidity and capital measures, you have monetary policy, you have the credit programs, um, you have direct transfers, and you have uh, tax deferrals and taxes uh, uh, cancelling. And, and basically, when you look at these five things, uh, the central bank participates in the top three. So. Uh, we were involved in liquidity plus capital and monetary policy and in design some of the credit programs. Um, and we, we believed very, very uh, deeply in the separation in, in a sense that everything that uh, had money from the treasury needed to be done uh, by the Minister of Econom Economics. And we, we, we didn't want to cross. We were very afraid um, uh, and we were very skeptical of some of the experience that we are seeing in other countries of central bank crossing a little bit into doing um, quasi-fiscal policy. So we, we were very careful in that sense. But we, I think we were very proactive from the very beginning. Uh, we started releasing liquidity in, in the first week of March. And actually, at, at that time, we were highly criticized and, and, and the OMS had not declared pandemic yet. So we were, we were very early in the stage. When you look at the size of the measures, uh, we're also uh, criticized to some extent because we did a, a, a big, big package. Uh, we are talking about 17% of GDP in liquidity plus 20% of GDP in capital. So we started releasing uh, liquidity. I won't have time here to talk about all the measures. We did more than 15 measures. 
Um, but I, I'll probably divide the measures as we initially thought about them in three parts. We had one group that was designing uh, was designed uh, at keeping the system liquid and capitalized. Uh, the second group of measures were, was uh, directed towards the mar market functioning. So we, we want to make sure that we didn't have any disruption in the markets. That was very important to us. And the third part was we knew that some sectors would need more credit than others, and we wanted to direct credit to some sectors, giving incentives to banks to direct credit to some specific sectors. So those are the three main things. When you look at the corporate world and the way we design credit, and that uh, was the work that we did together with the Minister of, of Economics, we basically divided in three parts. It was simple to do that. At that time, we were doing a lot of different things. Uh, so it was simple to do, uh, to divide in three parts. You know, for the structural bigger groups like airlines and things like that, uh, we did models uh, that were more, uh, I would say, capital market models. So we did first loss models. Uh, so we tried to leverage uh, the help to these companies using capital markets. Uh, for SMEs and for medium, large, medium and SME, com SME companies, but not the bigger ones, uh, we did various programs. Uh, we had programs that uh, were linked to payroll, were programs to, uh, that was linked to uh, uh, directing credit. And then on the very small companies, we did uh, using retail, uh, retail structure. So we did a leverage structure uh, guaranteeing. Uh, we've guaranteed by the treasury, we use the credit card machine, so we had uh, many things uh, that we did. Um, and, and, and I think when I try to draw the lessons, I think uh, there was a lot of learning experience and, and was very important for us. Um, a lot of other countries had done a lot of measures and Brazil was not, uh, was not uh, pre prepared for that at the time. I would say some of the, 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 the things that we did that, that I think will be useful or for a long time, um, mentioning that was the first time that we gave liquidity to banks in exchange for private credit. Uh, until then, every time that we need to put liquidity in the system, uh, the collateral was always public credit. So this changes the whole chain uh, of uh, issuing private debt and the way you see private debt. And the banks can charge less premium when they hold private debt in the balance sheets because now they know they can get liquidity out of that. So this is a change that we're going to make permanent, and uh, we are designing a system to make that permanent. One other thing was the first time that we exchanged tax credits for direct lending. That was a very, very difficult program to do. Uh, we need to talk to the to the tax collection agencies. You know, banks have a lot of tax credit, and it forms a large part of the capital base. We need to make sure that we put this to work. Um, and I think it was the first time that we did payroll lending through combined, uh, various combined programs with the treasury. So I think the lessons that we've learned is uh, when we think about uh, <clears throat> those programs, when you have programs that share risk with banks, the government sharing risk with banks, uh, they're more efficient because you know that the banks will select the credit uh, well, so they're more efficient, but also the money take, take longer, takes longer to be allocated, much longer. So that was one lesson that we learned. When we tried to uh, share risks, we knew that that was good because the, the banks would uh, be uh, very selective. And also to recover the credit at the end, the banks would have an incentive to recover. So this was good. But uh, the process of allocating money is, is slower uh, using that. Um, one other thing that we learned is when you look at payroll programs uh, uh, with counterparts in job, uh, in guaranteeing job, uh, that proved very difficult to be implemented in practice. I think US had a program that was very similar to ours. Um, it was very difficult to, uh, to follow the, the measures. Some of the companies were very skeptical to, to guarantee employment because they're not seeing uh, the future. At the end, I think this uh, program uh, had a low absorption because the way it was designed, the companies were afraid to keep the, 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 to keep the, the promise of keeping the jobs. One other lesson, lesson that we learned is that uh, when you give uh, liquidity in exchange for private credit, um, you optimize a lot of the things and you can actually put liquidity in the system and at the same time fix uh, distortion in financial markets, in the credit, in the credit markets. Because at the, at the same time that you're giving liquidity to the banks, you're giving a message to the financial markets uh, and to the, to, the private, to, the, to the private credit market that you are there as a central banker. So I think that's one 
uh, one, one, one difficult. And I think uh, probably the final and the most difficult uh, uh, lesson and the, it was the most difficult process is at the end, it's very difficult to make sure that the money gets, gets to the very small companies one way or the other. When you do government programs and you distribute it to banks, you want to make sure that the, the money is getting to the, the, the guys that need it. Um, but the banks will obviously select the ones that have better credit. Uh, at the end, we, we did what we could. I think the program was very well done, but that proved to be very difficult. So I, I would say, uh, I would say uh, that was a lesson. And I think to finish, I think the main lesson that we had is uh, it's better to err uh, on, on, on doing too much than, than doing too little. So we had many programs that had low absorption. That was not a problem, um, but we knew that we needed to do many programs to test the ones that were more efficient. Thank you. Thanks, Roberto. No, very, very interesting. And let's uh, uh, to finish, let's turn to structural issues, because not only you and your colleagues at the, at the board focus on managing the pandemic, uh, uh, supporting uh, uh, the private sector, but you continue to implement the, the structural agenda that the BCB has had for, for a while. And, and in that, in that uh, uh, respect, I think it's very interesting uh, what you have done on the fintech uh, world. Uh, the instant payment system uh, was launched in November and open banking earlier this year. How important are these reforms in improving uh, competition in the sector, financial inclusion and transparency in uh, Brazil? What are the next steps and priorities? For example, how does the BCB assess the pros and cons of issuing a digital currency in the future? And let me add also uh, the other important structural uh, uh, issue that you have uh, included that uh, you have added to your BCB uh, agenda a sustainability pillar. What are the key goals of these pillars? What can central banks do to promote a green recovery? Thank you, Alejandro. Um, I will start with the, the structural agenda and technology. And, and, and I think uh, I personally dedicated a lot of my time prior to coming to the central bank to studying uh, what the future of finance would be, uh, trying to identify identifying the, the trends uh, and, and understanding that it was very, uh, very much linked to uh, the, what was happening in technology. Um, I, I think a lot of people concentrate on the links between banks and fintechs. Um, I think it's much, much more than that. I think banks and fintechs, it's, I think it's uh, the natural way to look at this, but I, I think there's something going on that goes much, much bigger than that. It goes beyond than that, which is the interaction between banks, fintechs, and social media. Um, and we are seeing that in, 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 in ways that uh, uh, we didn't expect before. We are seeing that in, a, in an acceleration of, of, of improvement in technology. But let, let me keep he, uh, give you here an example. What we're seeing now, which I think seems to be the gold mine in terms of payments, is um, I would say a convergence between texting, uh, content, and payments. So, for example, we authorize what what's up uh, this week to start doing payments in Brazil. If you look at what's happening in India with Google and uh, Russia and some other countries, and you're seeing one way or another, uh, social media wants to do payments. Uh, Payments wants to uh, be linked to social media, and this is uh, coming from uh, I think the, the, this intrinsic demand that population has, the population, the society has to have those things uh, connected. So we, I think it's much bigger than that. When you look at, at the financial industry, um, it's all about data. And think that if you have texting, content, and payments all together, basically, when you look at a chain of sale of a product, basically you're going to have advertising of a product, sale of a product payment of a product, and you're going to have interpretation of what the client thinks of a product all in the same vertical chain. That's very, very powerful. Um, and, and, and it's very powerful because it's it's beginning to uh, to become an industry that is all about data. It was already like that, but it's accelerating a lot. Uh, the innovation that we had in the last couple of years were basically that it's much cheaper to produce data, it's much cheaper to store data, but now it's much cheaper to interpret data. And this is only in the beginning as we get an approach to the quantum process 
and, 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 and all the uh, artificial intelligence mechanisms that are out there and they're you know, uh, growing very fast. So, so I think at the end, it's about the data. So understanding and recognizing that this is about data production, data organization, and data interpretation, um, we wanted to be part of that and we wanted to be prepared for that as a central bank. So we, we thought that uh, we needed to launch something in terms of payment. They had the following characteristics that was cheap, that was fast, uh, that was secure, that was transparent, and that was open. When you think, why, when you ask people why they think cryptocurrency is the way of the future, they'll probably give you that answer because they demand uh, a payment method that has these uh, exact <coughs> characteristics. So that was the idea of building PIX. Uh, PIX uh, Pix has had uh, an ex extraordinary uh, development. We never expect that to happen. We thought we could have uh, 20 million keys registered by the end of six months. That happened in, in, in a few days. We now have 70% of the population in Brazil that have used Pix one way or another. We have 170 million keys registered. Uh, we actually think that Pix will be uh, will move into being something close to an, an, a digital identity for uh, the Brazilian people. Uh, beginning uh, soon, they will be able to pay taxes, pay all the utility bills, everything on PIX. Everything is going to be linked to the key that they have on PIX. So I think it's about digitalizing people. And this is very important because it promotes inclusion. On the second thing that you mentioned, open banking, it also relates to that because, you know, if I'm saying that everything is about data, um, nothing, uh, uh, nothing will, uh, n none of the financial products will be able to achieve success without having this process of data analytics. So basically, uh, the process that we are saying is that the data belong to the people. If the data belong to the people, basically what, you, what you're saying is that people can use the data to achieve better services, to have more tailor-made products at better prices. So this is what open banking is all about. And it's more than open bank. Actually, we, we are moving to the open finance uh, concept in which you're going <clears> to <throat> aggregate all the Product on, on the platform of open banking. Um, and also, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't uh, get to this full stage of evolution without talking about the currency. Currency is always uh, uh, a very important uh, storage of value, is a means of payments. So um, the currency in Brazil had a process that was very outdated. We had uh, one project was approved in Congress to speed up the simplification process of the currency. Uh, the, the laws of the currencies in Brazil, the currency in Brazil, dated from 1960, so that you have an idea when Brazil tried to import those uh, planes from Sweden and the engine uh, came from Germany. In theory, if you look at the law in Brazil, the, tur the turbine had to come to Brazil and then go to Sweden to come back with the plane because you can only pay a good if it crosses the border using our uh, outdated laws. So we needed to change everything about financial system, but we needed to change everything about the currency. So we had uh, this design in three stages, simplification, internationalization, and then convertibility. And I think the, the natural process at the end of that, uh, recognizing this word that I just described is that we're gonna have a digital currency. So we already started the process of a digital currency. We have a group studying that. Um, like I've said, I think we have more questions than answers today. It's very important that this process takes place uh, in a conversation with other central bankers because at the end, uh, one important feature of this currency will be the cross-border payment. So we need to make sure that uh, the, the currencies, the digital currencies converge somehow. Um, I think the three main topics now is whether this is a central issuance uh, out of the central bank or if any bank can retire cash and, and issue currencies. Uh, issue digital currency, whether the custody is going to be centralized or not, whether it's going to be traceable or not. So there are some of these points that, that we, we have been discussed, uh, we have been discussing a lot. One other thing that needs to go along with that is the sandbox. We need to have this environment in which people can actually generate ideas in terms of apps, in terms of uh, segmenting financial products in a way uh, that uh, will speed up the process. So we also developed the sandbox uh, regulation. Um, and I think one last uh, word of that, and I think it's a stage that's yet to come, but I, I think it will probably pick up in the next couple of years, mm -hmm. is this process of tokenization of, good, of, of goods and services. Um, I think we are going to this uh, process of wider use of blockchain 
And I think a lot of the things will, will become token in a way, one, one way or the other. So we're going to have all these smart contracts going around. It's going to be important to have a currency that has the same technology. So I think everything is going to lead into um, that future. And then on, on the point that you mentioned on the sustainability agenda, here again, uh, we, we, we launched a very, very wide uh, sustainability agenda um, in September of 2020. Uh, it's not about only climate risk, it's about uh, social and environmental issues uh, um, on a wider uh, base. <clears throat> I think it's, it's in part recognizing that what the society demands this recovery to be um, and has basically two important dimensions, to be inclusive and to be sustainable. So we deal with the inclusiveness part on our technology agenda, and we needed to deal with the sustainability on this dimension of the agenda. So um, we understand that we need to foster a sustainable and dynamic financial environment in that sense. When you look at how this plays out, uh, I think you had three waves. Um, and we've talked about that in the past and the way in which which Brazil needed, that the third wave was coming and was going to be very important. And the three waves are the following. It's about producing energy, clean energy, and that was that's gone now. I mean, everybody, this is basically a common practice right now. The second one is to produce food in a clean, in a, in a sustainable way. But the third and more important wave, which is uh, hitting uh, most of emerging market countries right now, is this financial flow. It's investors with environmental governance. Uh, the investor won't invest in your country or in your company if you are not, uh, if you're, if you're not, uh, let's say, uh, sustainable in, in one way or another. So uh, we we design agenda <clears throat> to have this uh, wide sense of sustainability. Um, we have sustainable finance. We have management of social and environment and climate risks uh, within the financial system. We have the sustainability related variables. Uh, within the central bank in the decision-making process. Uh, the actions were divided in many programs. I won't have time to talk all about all of them. When you look at regulation and supervision, it was very important to have the disclosure dimension uh, very clear to everyone. It's important to have transparency on, on your policies. Uh, we did partnerships. Uh, we are a member of the NGFS now, the CBI, the, the, the Bond Institute. Um, on supervision, we have this whole design on how to collect information, how to do stress tests using uh, this data. Um, and uh, we, we created this uh, green, uh, green Bureau of Agrocredit, which I think is like an open banking for green sustainable finance. Um, and we adopted the, the, the concept of climate risk, both physical and the transitional concept. So I won't, again, I won't have time to to go into everything, the, the, the parts of it, it refers to new money. So we have incentives for green credit up to 20%, uh, increasing the limits. But at the end is to give a message to the financial system that we are serious about that and that we have an agenda that put us in the frontier uh, of the knowledge in terms of sustainable finance. Thank you. Roberto, it has been a pleasure talking to you. As always, you have given us much food for thought. Thank you very much for your time and thank everyone for joining us. From the IMF in Washington, I wish everybody a very good day.